Hello, everybody. Very nice to meet you. Um, and thanks for coming. And thanks for trying to listen to a, a little bit of different presentation than what you heard today. I'm going to talk about Internet of Things. Of course, a little bit of healthcare, but it will be more about Internet of Things and IoT. Um, I work, I am Sokul Ri. I work as an associate director of cyber physical systems at NIST. Uh, NIST is part of the Department of Commerce, and we work mostly on science and engineering. So a little bit of a stats, uh, NIST is uh, a, a DOC uh, bureau, and we have about 3,000 scientists and engineers, and also close to 2,800 uh, associates and facility users. Uh, we had about five Nobel Prize winners for the last 20 years. Uh, so you can kind of see that we really, really focus on science and engineering. So why are we talking about Internet of Things? And we heard about wearables today. Uh, and uh, wearables uh, is a part of IoT ecosystem in general. But it's a bigger picture. Uh, we call it cyber physical systems. So by the way, cyber physical systems is nothing more than IoT, Internet of Things. Cyber means connectivity, is internet. Uh, and physical means things that you can, uh, you can uh, you know, touch, feel, and so. So cyber physical systems is IoT. Uh, what it really means is a hybrid system of physical, uh, physical components and connectivity and software. Virtually everything you see these days kind of like fall into this category, smart thermostats, uh, smart vehicles, uh, smart healthcare, smart sensors, anything that with the word smart, that means you have something with a cyber component on it. Uh, by the way, please do not confuse, uh, do not confuse the cyber security. That's not cyber physical system. When, when you talk about cyber security, there's a whole different world and I'm not gonna talk about cybersecurity today. Um, so why are we talking about IoT and cyber physical systems, which is CPS? Two, 300 years ago, the Industrial Revolution changed our world. Essentially what it did was they came up with a new way to manufacture the goods and the products. And then 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, this internet revolution has completely changed our lives again. What did it, what did, it do? It changed our way of doing things uh, using internet, uh, or PC, if you will. For example, we didn't have to keep our logbooks anymore. Uh, you have Excel spreadsheet, which does a beautiful job, and you have a financial software that can take care of our tax return, for example. So, if you combine this industrial revolution with the internet revolution, that ends up with the cyber physical systems. Now we combine this physical revolution with the cyber revolution, revolution, revolution that becomes the next wave of revolution. So, um, by the way, I can't believe it's gonna be 80 degrees here and it's mid-October in DC. I'm from Boston, it never happens over there, never. okay? So um, I was brought in, uh, I came into DC about three years ago, okay? I was brought in uh, to work on IoT. I was, uh, uh, they gave me a, uh, they hired me as a, a, a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow to work on cyber physical systems. And three years ago was about a time, about the time that all this buzz around IoT started to come up. By the way, IoT is not new. Okay, it's been around for probably decades, more than two or three decades. Uh, it was called M2M at some point. It was called uh, Smart Systems. Uh, it, was, it was called all this, it, with all these different names, wireless sensor networks and so on. So why are we hearing all this buzz about internal things? So really it comes down to the cost issue, the sensors, which you had to pay 100 bucks to get a decent uh, uh, sensor to measure in temperature, now you can, I, I'm not talking about the whole product, I'm talking about just a sensor. Now you can actually buy it with a couple of bucks, which is extremely, extremely uh, impressive. 
And also, uh, you can kind of see the sensors and collected data, the amount of the sensor, amount of data increases exponentially. That creates a new opportunity for us. So, let me just go through the what IoT is. We already talked about uh, the general concept of this in previous presentations this morning. IoT is really four layers, okay? Uh, at the bottom of the layer, there is the hardware layer. This is the physical components, sensors, actuators, and radios, and the chips that you can, you can touch. Sometimes this is as large as a car or as an airplane sometimes. Uh, on top of that, you have a communication layer. Essentially, you connect these things through Wi-Fi, cellular network, or a Bluetooth, whatever you, you can think of uh, uh, as a connectivity. Now, a lot of people think that IoT is the bottom of the layer. That's wrong. There are two more extremely important layers that really add value, both from commercial perspective also from uh, the, the research perspective on top of that. So on top of the communication layer, there is this data analytics layer. This is where you take the data collected from bottom layers and extract useful information. So by the way, uh, there was one thing I agreed with one of the speakers that speak, spoke uh, uh, a couple, an hour ago. Um, data, a lot of people say data is a new currency. It is extremely valuable. I do not agree. Data has almost zero value. Data is basically ones and zeros. It's ones and zeros. There's no meaning. If you have a bunch of ones and zeros, that doesn't really mean anything. That doesn't really have a lot of value. The value is created when you extract actionable, useful information out of this set of the data. And that's where data analytics comes in. That's where the real value and business value is created, okay? On top of that, there is a service layer. This is the most important and the most valuable layer. This layer makes a decision. Based on the information you collected through all these sensors, wearables, and all these things, you have to make a decision on what to do with it. It's not just a visualization. It's a, you have to take an action. When you take an action, that's where the 90%, I personally think, more than 90% of the value of IoT ecosystem is realized. So if you look at the information flow, it's not just the monitoring, actually it's also taking action, meaning that you are coming back, closing the loop. I'll give you one example. Um, about 16, 17 years ago, uh, at MIT, uh, they developed something called a ring sensor. This is a great idea. It's a finger ring, essentially. You have batteries, you have a CPU, you have a wireless, you have a, a optical sensors. Essentially, it detects vital signs, uh, you know, heart rate and uh, oxygen saturation and blood pressure in a finger ring. And you carry 24 hours. Wherever you go, if there's any problem, seems to be a problem, then you get alerted. So that was back in 2000. Great job, right? Um, so, you may ask a question, that's a great idea. I want to give it to my fiance for my engagement ring. Why cannot, why can't I buy it from uh, Tiffany, right? Um, yeah, there's a technology issue, technical issue. It's extremely tough to put everything into this small ring, and then actually you, you go, you know, first, first, the most of the customers and the, well, who will use this ring is essentially uh, either patients or you know, people who need monitoring. So they are not gonna be used to changing battery, replacing battery every day. Once you have this in here, it has to go for months or years. That's challenging, all right? But in addition to that, the issue is much bigger than that. So when I was brought in as a White House Innovation Fellow, I was given a task to figure out why we are not seeing why we are not seeing exponential growth of IoT and CPS in our, in our world, okay? We see incremental growth. We talk about it. There are a lot of wearables coming out on that. But we do not see the critical uh, uh, momentum like cell phone in industry enjoyed for the last 20 years, okay? So why is that? 
What, if, what he concluded at the time was, it was little, is, is because the IoT and CPS landscape is extremely fragmented. Give you an example. Medical devices companies develop medical devices. But a lot of the technology they are using could or can come from transportation system or personal uh, you know, smartphones, for example, or from disaster response system. Okay? They are all developing these things in silos. They do not, do not have a lot of interoperability. They do not share a lot of uh, the, the knowledge, uh, knowledge experiences. So how do we encourage collaboration and create tangible benefits and create economies of scale? That's really the core of the question. I'll give an example what it means by cross-sectoral collaboration or cross-sectoral example. Crash to care scenario. You have a huge accident pile in, in, in a highway. And what happens? Somebody's going to call 911, and ambulances are going to come. They're going to start calling hospitals around. And who, who has the beds available? Who has the right uh, surgeon and doctors available? If they're not available, you've got to call another hospital because you have 30 injured uh, people, for example. As a mess, all right? In this example, uh, what you do today is literally use your cell phone and call hospitals. That's what kind of, it's a, it's a command center. This was an example in Boston Marathon incidents a few years ago, and they did a heroic job to take care of the situation with a given, with a given limitations and systems. But we believe we could have done better if you had a system that could uh, coordinate and orchestrate and also connect these different emergency response system, hospital tri triage system, uh, availability of the hospital resources, and availability of the traffic ambulances. Obviously, they want to all come in. They will get there faster. Can traffic system handle this kind of thing? If you had uh, something like this, cross-sectoral collaboration, that we could have done better. Um, so a few years ago, we created a program called the Smart America Challenge. It was a collaboration program to bring in industry, academia, government agencies, all together to really encourage collaboration with a very specific goals, like saving lives, creating more jobs, creating more businesses, and uh, improving the economy. Um, that was a very successful program, and after that, uh, NIST uh, 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 basically took it in, uh, we call it inst institutionalized. I'm still trying to figure out the government terms. I'm not exactly used to that, but I'm, I'm trying. Uh, institu <laughs> institutionalize it, and uh, create a, a program called the Global City Teams Challenge. And the, uh, the goal is pretty simple. We want to create economies of scale. Whatever we do in IoT, healthcare, disaster, and transportation, and environment. Because without economies of scale, it will be just science fair going forward. It's going to be just a bits and pieces in here and there. We want to create replicable, scalable, and sustainable model. And we wanted to bring in cities. Why? Because cities is a unit that you experience your life every day with. All right? So with the partnership with the cities, transportation, healthcare, environment, we wanted to create teams and create a measurable impacts. So currently, we have about 100 teams in total, uh, over 120 cities from all around the world participating, over 300 companies, universities, nonprofits are participating. So what do we do? OK, so this is what we do. Uh, this is actually a smart city, uh, a capacity building program, but healthcare is an extremely important part of it. Uh, if you go to any city, and if you go to the healthcare department or the environmental department, they, they work with the companies, obviously, and they work with the hospitals, but those are extremely fragmented and they come with their plans one by one. Essentially, the plan in New York City doesn't necessarily, it's not designed to work with the plan in Boston or San Francisco. The problem is, if every city has a different plan and different homegrown solutions, you're going to never get to economies of scale. Cities are not happy 
because they have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Companies are not happy because they cannot sell their products more than once, right? It has to be customized and all the time, and whether it's a database, a data analytics system, and that is a big problem. So how do we address this issue? We address this issue through a concept of action clusters. So instead of each city working with each company or university, we want to bring in multiple cities, get them around, uh, coalesce them around the same topic of the shared interest. Transportation, autonomous vehicles, healthcare, air quality, asthma issues. And also, we want to bring in companies and universities to coalesce around, on the, around the topics. So outcome of this effort well, naturally, because it was developed by multiple cities and multiple companies, will be replicable and scalable and sustainable. Now, we've done this for the last one year, and we have about 100 action clusters we put together. Now, next step, we want to go with the super clusters. What does that mean? So, um, I'll go to more of a healthcare uh, example here, because this is a healthcare conference, but it's, re it's, it's related to other sectors as well. Every sector, transportation, water, and uh, healthcare has specific solutions they develop. But each solution by itself cannot address, cannot create the real synergy. We have to bring them all together under one umbrella. So that's what we are doing. Multiple action clusters get together, create super cluster, that can create a blueprint, implementation plan that can apply to any city in the world. I'll give you a few examples of what happened during the last three years uh, out of this over 150 teams. Closed loop healthcare, that's a, that's a mass general hospital collaboration, collaborating with a bunch of companies and universities as well. Uh, essentially, this is an example that was also addressed in a previous presentation. There is a data set that you collect uh, in your home. I mean, you have a home healthcare system. When you have a heart attack, uh, you are brought into the hospital and ambulances, and the hospital go through all these tests again. I mean, you, they put your EKG, and they put you all kinds of uh, you know, tests again. If you had an access to the data set that you already collected for the last three years at home, wouldn't it be great that you can figure things out a lot easier than you have to go through all these tests from the beginning one more time? So that's the concept. How do you actually try to coordinate different, uh, the home healthcare system to different hospital healthcare system. Um, bottom left, this is uh, emergency neurological life support. This is really about the crash, care, uh, crash to care scenario I talked about. Scale project uh, on, on, on the top right, that's a Montgomery County, uh, installing fall detection sensors to, uh, into uh, a senior living facility so that, oh, by the way, uh, you probably know this, hundreds of people die every year in the United States uh, because they just fall on the ground. It's not because they are sick, they just fall on the ground, they cannot get up. They don't have a, a muscle and strength to get up. Just stay there, uh, well, they fall there, down there, stay there for three days, they die, okay? And simple fall sensor, detection sensors, can solve the problem. If you can detect it, send an uh, emergency signal to the emergency department so they can ch check that out. Um, I don't have a lot of time left, so I, I came too far here. So uh, we cannot do this. I cannot do this by, by myself. We do it with the partnerships, with all these departments, uh, National Science Foundation, ITA, GSA, uh, state, and transportation. All these departments work together, also companies, all the companies that work on IoT in general work together. Also, this is international and global activity. Uh, one thing I want to really make sure we understand is we cannot, when I say we, the U.S. cannot do this by ourselves. And it's not right that we do it by ourselves because whatever we come up with may not work in Europe, may not work in Asia. Then there's no economies of scale. So we have to do it globally. Um, we go through this process, and the way we do matchmaking and these things is by bringing them to an event. Uh, and as one of the mechanisms, uh, next week, Tuesday and uh, Wednesday, we are going to have a uh, GCTC, Global City Team Challenge, a kickoff uh, a super cluster conference uh, in a, a Grand Hyatt Hotel, Washington, D.C., over here. 
So if you, any of you are interested uh, in healthcare, we are going to have a separate healthcare session on it. Uh, please come and join that.